are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the People on the Go Lunch and Learn webinar. My name is Melissa, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Before we start, let's check and make sure that you can see the screen and hear me. If you can please use the questions panel on the right side of your screen to type a brief note indicating that you can hear me and see the screen, that would be great. Thank you so much, Norma and Kay. Thank you very much. Um, by the way, this is the same questions panel that we'll use for questions later at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions in the interim, feel free to ask them there too. And if you need technical assistance, there's the number right there for you. Today's webinar is Visual Leaders Capitalizing on the Visualization Revolution. And I have with me David Sibbett, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. Just a quick background about why we have these sessions, especially for those who are with us for the first time. We have these sessions because our focus at People on the Go is productivity in the workplace. And the topics that you see on the screen are the topics that we cover. We have them available in a variety of formats, including the webinar format, just like today's session. The webinars are offered on a monthly basis and you can check them out on the website there. We also have a membership program that makes these webinars very easy to take advantage of. And we have many resources available like the blog, Facebook, LinkedIn groups, and you can also follow our founder, Pierre Kwand, on Twitter. And now let's dive into today's topic. Let me introduce our speaker, David Sibbett. President and founder of the Grove Consultants uh, International, David Sibbett has been an organizational consultant and information designer since 1977. He is the author of John Wiley and Sons three volume visual leadership series, plus many of the Grove's leading edge group process tools and models for facilitation, team leadership and organizational transformation. His new book, Visual Leaders, New Tools for Visioning, Management and Organization describes visual best practices for leaders and managers of organizations. David is a master facilitator of large scale group processes, strategic visioning and creative future oriented symposia. He frequently lends his coaching and design expertise to Grove project teams and his practices informed by eight years of public affairs leadership development through the Coro Northern California Center for Civic Leadership. David holds a master's degree from Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University and a BA in Literature from Occidental College in Los Angeles. And now I'm going to turn it over to David, and uh, this transition is just going to take a few moments. Good morning, Melissa, and everyone who's online for this program. Um, we're going to spend about a half an hour uh, looking at some of the concepts in this new book on visual leaders, new tools for visioning management and organization change. And then um, if you ask questions uh, in the questions panel for the GoToMeeting uh, Lunch and Learn seminar, then Melissa will be able to share those with me, and I'll uh, answer as many as I can before the end of this webinar. Um, this, this page here uh, shows the book and the topic of this particular Lunch and Learn, which is how you as a leader or manager, if you are one, or if you're a person who's supporting leaders and managers, can capitalize on the visualizing revolution. A good friend of mine says it takes 30 years to be an overnight success here in Silicon Valley. Um, and you know, starting back in 1972, 77, uh, we are now experiencing a huge interest in this field. Uh, Wiley approached uh, us a couple of years ago and asked if we would begin a series to kind of create some literature on this. And so in 2010, I wrote Visual Meetings, which uh, how you can use graphics, sticky notes, and idea mapping to transform group productivity. And we focused on visual meetings because that's 
probably the starting point for uh, companies and organizations getting visual, and it's a tremendous way to blend creativity and productivity. Uh, the following year, um, I wrote visual teams, and teams, of course, have lots of meetings, but they also do a lot of things in between meetings, and lots of teams are virtual. And so this book ex shows you how to apply visual meetings across the whole arc of a team's work and how to work with it uh, in the new media environments. This new book uh, deals directly with managers and leaders and how they can take advantage of this by either working with visual practitioners like myself or others who do this kind of work or by creating an environment where their own employees can be more visual. Um, one of the questions you asked me, Melissa, when we were talking through this is uh, maybe answering the question right up front is, can I draw? Is that necessary for this? Absolutely not. This particular talk here is all about um, being aware visually and being able to know what choices to make. But this is not, uh, this latest book is not about how to draw. Now, I am using, you may be interested in that little uh, thing up in the corner there. That is a, a layers panel tool uh, in a program called Sketchbook Pro. And let me zoom in on uh, the book title here to kind of show you how this works. Um, I've got a little tool panel down on the right here. And Sketchbook Pro, uh, you know, I'll write it out for you. Uh, Sketchbook Pro is provided by Autodesk. And it's an application either for a computer or for uh, a tablet, and uh, the different kinds of tablets. And what it allows you to do is um, to write on a, a tablet. And I basically have a tablet connected to a computer. And I'm able to take notes here. Now, I'm trying something a little different in this book, which is I am pulled images into Sketchbook Pro that will then also allow me to draw while I'm doing it. And I wanted to show you here on this cover what we're going to talk about a little bit. The cover, in a way, is what uh, the Grove calls story maps. And story maps are uh, a visualization that allows a person to tell a story. And so this little story about what the visual revolution means is on a topography here representing the Earth, of all the different forces that are going on right now. I mean, you have an explosion in visual language if you think about uh, the web and the Internet and Facebook and all the different ways we consume media. Most of it now is a tight integration of text and graphics. Uh, design thinking is a very big idea now. Uh, Stanford's actually offering courses on design thinking for business. It's become very popular. IDEO and companies like that are showing people how to innovate and prototype. Uh, virtual work is exploding. Visual meetings are exploding. Startups and growth organizations and institutions are all trying to figure out how to deal with all the changes and dynamics. And in this context, um, what I was dealing with in this book is how you can use visuals to really formulate and communicate strategy and also how you can implement it. And there's a little picture here of a story map for a health organization called Health East, and one of the chapters in this book is a very detailed case study of how they used visual leadership to align all the different 35-something quality programs in their organization. Of course, I have my name here on a little iPad just to suggest that interfacing with these new mobile technologies is one of the big challenges that comes in, and of course, have a marker. Um, being able to work on paper is still a very important aspect of this. And as I will show you, there are many aspects of it that can really only be done in huge panoramic display. So that's kind of what the book is about. Now, I want to start um, getting into some of the content. I'm going to deal with uh, several different things. I'm going to, uh, but first here, let's take a look at the territory. Um, a fellow named Eric Link, Everett Linquist showed up uh, in my office a couple of months ago and said, I've been looking at the field of visualization to help analysts in uh, government. And he's working at the School of Public Policy up in Victoria, Canada. Uh, how to help analysts talk to policymakers about all the things that they're discovering as they go through uh, all their research. 
And he says visualization is turning out to be a very big deal for them. So I've written a white paper about the field. And he had in this white paper three domains. Uh, one is traditional graphic design. Another is the area of data visualization. And another is what he called visual facilitation, which is the sort of thing that I've been doing for a long time. Um, as we talked, I added a fourth uh, because I think the inner world of visualization, what we do inside of our minds itself, is as important as what we're doing outside. Now, if you go over and look at, at graphic design, um, designers have worked visually for a long period of time. Um, this is not a new way of working. So if you're, uh, if you're a designer, you're going to pick up a pen and you're going to draw sketches of things and share them with people. And now with tablets, uh, you can draw all kinds of sketches and share them. Uh, you can even do this now on, on mobile phones. But presentation designers, web designers, magazine designers, all these people uh, are, in fact, you working visually. Now, one of the latest explosions in the last couple of decades has been data visualization. Uh, many of the advances in science um, are now actually advances in looking at scientific data on computers. The same thing's true now with data analytics from all the social networking. And uh, many, many, many of the internet sites are, can capture lots of data. And people are starting to use visualization as a way to look at it. Geodata mapping, financial analysis, and simulation modeling, these are all exploding. And of course, there's an overlap uh, between these two. And this is part of what's giving rise to this visual interest. Now, that is not what Visual Leader's book is about principally, even though um, this third area of visual facilitation that I've been working in has been heavily informed by all of the tools of regular designers. In fact, in the 70s, those of us who were starting uh, to work this way were very influenced by architects and designers and the kind of problem solving that people do when they're in a studio kind of setting. Um, these are some of the names that people go by, visual practice, graphic recording, graphic facilitation, strategic visioning, scenario planning. These are all different things that people do. And what they're really talking about here is uh, working interactively with a group, uh, usually on paper, but it can be virtually. And it's about people talking and having it, seeing it recorded and then being able to see what's happening and going round and round. That's the interactive part that this area deals with. Cognitive visualization is are the visions, the metaphors, the mental models, frames of reference. Uh, at a very deep level, the paradigms or the viewing frames that we use in our whole life. Dream imagery, these are all things that happen uh, in the privacy of our own consciousness. But they end up being a, ter a tremendously integral part of these other areas. Now, you're beginning to see a certain amount of uh, terms for some of these overlap areas. One of them is information architecture, a term popularized by uh, Saul Werman, who was a famous designer. Information design by Tufte at Yale. Uh, you're seeing design thinking talked about as a uh, way to thinking about these overlaps here and information visualization. So you may hear all these terms about it, but the sum of this whole mapping process was that this is, in fact, uh, a new explosive domain, probably every bit as important as learning how to work with numbers and learning how to work with text alone. So let's dive in and look at some of this um, and talk about PowerPoint to begin with. PowerPoint really... Uh, brought graphics to business and to everybody. And most people who work in business now will work on PowerPoints to get their ideas clear. And the blessing part of PowerPoint is that it's one, it's a tremendous prototyping environment in that you can do versions of what you're thinking and get instant feedback from the computer, back and forth, back and forth. And after, you know, three or four hours of working on a PowerPoint slide, I show here somebody working on an org diagram thing, it really gets clear. Here's the problem. The problem is 
that people rarely let people who are consuming the PowerPoint spend anywhere near that amount of time. Uh, you get it in email, and boy, it's all you can do to, you know, look at that enclosure if it's really complicated. And in most presentations that I've been in, you may have a minute on a slide if you're lucky, um, and it zips off very quickly. Uh, PowerPoint moves too quickly for people to actually come to any original new thinking. So what people do when they're bombarded with information that's this dense, and it often is, they just filter it through what they already know and the mental models that they already use. So if you're really interested in visual leadership and getting innovation and new thinking, you want to figure out a way how back to the experience people had originally, how you can emulate some of that actually in a meeting setting. So how do you do that? Well, visual meeting methodology is something that visual leaders need to understand. Uh, they not, don't need to do it themselves, but they need to understand how powerful it is. And it goes without saying that visuals really are a key to imagining anything. But what's less clear is that visuals are really a power tool for engagement. Um, this little drawing that I have here, of somebody talking and then somebody listening and somebody visualizing and then somebody seeing, uh, creates a, a cycle that is so stimulating to anybody's mind. You may have a little bit of sense of this here in this webinar, is that you don't know what I'm going to draw next. And I may go up here and turn on a picture, uh, which I just did. Now, here is um, the director of the Exploratorium in San Francisco standing in front of a vision that was created in a day getting ready for a big move that they're making actually right now to the piers in San Francisco. This is one of the foremost... Uh, science museums in the country and has really pioneered discovery-based learning. And they had their entire organization calling out ideas and seeing the results, calling out more ideas, seeing the results, spending two days immersed in their own thinking. We did the history of the organization. We looked at visions. We looked at action plans. The level of engagement was, was terrific and kind of unparalleled. But visuals are also one of the ways that you can really think. Here is uh, an Autodesk group, and you can look at this room. You don't need to know the information, but there's a total panorama of information. Over here we have regular graphic recording, which is a visual meeting strategy, and then you have sticky notes here. Here's the recording, and then over here we have PowerPoints. And then what you can't see here is we had people in two remote locations on uh, Skype who were actually part of the meeting. This kind of thing allowed us to do panoramic thinking in a group using, and visualization was the way to do it. Uh, finally, the final power is the power of using visual to enact. And here's a, an architectural group, the DLR group. And you'll notice this is a graphic template up here, which has a uh, arrow heading at a target this group did six action plans in one day, all working collaboratively in a hotel room uh, using sticky notes and other things. And they were able to share these action plans with each other and basically support enactment. Now, these four powers, the ability to support imagination, engagement, thinking, and action, are pretty much there from the moment you pick up a marker or work on paper or you ask a graphic recorder or facilitator to work with you. But you need to know what to ask for, and you need to know why this is important. So in Visual Leaders, I uh, focused in on seven tools, which I think are essential for leaders. Now, I'm not expecting you to read this, but I wanted to show you what a page from the book looks like. Uh, but if you look down here uh, at the bottom of this first one, I said the first set of tools is models and metaphors. Uh, and it's really what's inside the head. This drawing is uh, out of a, one of my journals, and I just uh, included it in here because I've spent a lot of time thinking about thinking in this work. But these questions down here are really interesting ones. You know, are you aware of when you're using metaphoric thinking? You know, are metaphors and models meaningful to you, are the ones that are meaningful to you, meaningful to your team? Uh, do you know how to link your internal ways of thinking with memorable images? Uh, these are all the kind of questions a visual leader would ask, and they all have to do with your 
consciousness about metaphors and models. And I'll get into a little bit more of that in, in a minute or so. The second tool is visual meetings, and I won't go over that. I've already described it quite a bit, but here's a little picture about them and the powers of the visual meetings that I just reviewed. The third um, tool set are graphic templates. Um, over the years, the Grove has developed these large format things. These, these can be on the wall, four foot by eight foot, or on a tabletop or even worksheets. You'll notice the little picture here has some that are worksheets down on the table. It also has examples of these on the wall in series. Um, what graphic templates allow you to do is to work with breakout groups and larger groups and compare similar sketches. It allows you to really work in a kind of design thinking kind of a way, doing very quick sketches of stuff. And what you get is insight, panorama, and retention with this way of working. You also don't have to draw. You're basically providing people these templates and pens. So that's the third essential tool. A fourth are decision rooms. Decision rooms are special environments like this picture of our conference room at the Grove, which I've simulated in Second Life. Um, people sitting at a table like this and being able to actually see the sweep of their thinking uh, can make much better decisions about things. And there are a number of exercises in the book that show you simple ways to do things uh, with sticky notes on four box grids and other kinds of templates. So decision rooms is a fourth essential tool. A fifth one is our roadmaps and visual plans. This is a key to implementation. And the picture down here is a picture of the Presidio um, transformation process. When the Army abandoned the Presidio in San Francisco, it became a national park. And they went through an elaborate several-year process of making that conversion. Uh, in facilitating that, we used this large graphic display of the whole process. And it was used to orient public and public meetings about what was happening. You can't read it at this level, but all the little, uh, I'll zoom in here, all the little yellow circles in this drawing um, were places for public input. And you could, in about five seconds show people this and say here are all the different places that you can play across this entire process. Um, by the way, the electronic version of this book um, allows anybody to, when one of these pictures shows up, to link into um, a website that we've created that has larger versions of them so you can see detailed examples. The sixth uh, essential tool are graphic story maps. And these, you know, the, the road map down below would be an example, but this is an example of a vision map up at the top here for Health East that's on the cover of the book. And what's important to know about story maps is there's a whole process of getting, having a bunch of different meetings to develop the content. And it's in all these meetings that you get alignment of all the people as they begin seeing their words and their ideas reflected in the map. There were conservatively uh, two or three dozen meetings all over this health system uh, to generate this picture and align all their quality programs. So the book explains in some detail how to do that. And then finally is the whole world of video. And video uh, is just coming on like gangbusters. Young people are very fluid with it. And if we think about it, most of us have a video camera in our pocket now. And how this is being used uh, at work and for learning is just exploding. It focuses attention. You get the personal touch with video, and you also have mobile memory. So I've mapped these seven um, essential tools onto the four flows uh, that we teach about how process works. And the book goes through and has chapters on each one of these. Um, in the next 10 minutes, I just want to zoom in on two, two different areas and then end up with technology, if we have the time. Um, one is looking at models for thinking. And I share in the book seven frameworks for thinking that I got uh, from Kenneth Boulding, who wrote an amazing book uh, in the late 60s called The Image. And he makes a very good case that when it comes to thinking about complexity and thinking about systems, there are really seven different choices that humans have. Um, 
and these little pictures and the criteria will show you. And one of the things you can do is play around. In the book, it's actually a questionnaire. I have little questions down here that you can test yourself to see if you know which ones you're familiar with and which ones you like. If you look at uh, non-living mental models, uh, the simplest one of all is a framework where parts are connecting. And the cool thing about this is these parts stay connected. It's it's reliable. It's simple. It doesn't move. And you'll see many company visions will be looking like this with uh, their vision up in the top and the pillars and the steps to getting there. But it's not really uh, the most complex way you can think. If you think about clockworks, which would include automobiles, vehicles, or clocks themselves, when mechanical objects began to be able to move in addition to be connected, you get a different kind of thing. And so you'll see some people really thinking about their business more uh, as a mechanical process that's moving. Or you'll see people talking about action planning as though it's like taking a trip in a car. If in the computer age we know that these machines also can adapt by being self-regulating, and here's a little picture of a thermostat. Well, a, an adaptive machine is much more complex and all-inclusive than one that just moves, is more inclusive than one that just is static. So these um, mental models kind of include the simpler ones in kind of a progression, but they are all different choices. Uh, in communications theory, when I was at Northwestern, the cybernetic model of communications, input, output, throughput, decoding, encoding, all that kind of word, that's all uh, this kind of thinking, was considered very avant-garde. Today, however, we're moving to a biological age where we have four more choices. And you'll see these are all things that uh, human beings know about from living in the world. Uh, one is if you have parts that connect, move, and adapt, and reproduce, you're in the world of living cells. And it's not an accident that we call terra cell cells in that part of their ability is to self-replicate and then carry the whole DNA with them. That's a very different kind of phenomenon than just a machine that's connected and moving. When colonies of these get together, like in the plant world, you get uh, growing things and you get ecosystems way of thinking. And uh, working at Hewlett Packard, uh, they actually train managers in thinking about business ecologies and value webs. These are all metaphors and models that come from the world of living plant systems. Finally, animals add one more level of complexity in that they can move. They've, they're whole groups of organizations. And finally, humans are self-aware in that process. So you can see how these mental models all form a nested set, even getting more and more complex. Uh, the interesting thing about these mental models is that humans are very uh, acquainted with their own experience, these, uh, you know, comparing what we do to other organizations that we know about, like a business might say, how can we be like Southwest Airlines? And we're also very familiar, you know, back here with uh, the machines that we all live with. And we're less familiar with these ones in the middle. Uh, how cells work and how plants work, and we're having less and less time out in nature, so we're not nearly as close to animal systems as we used to be. But the founding fathers of this country were all farmers and people who were very close to agriculture, and you see a lot of their belief in the systems of government we have and everything is based on their mental model that nature is kind of a self-correcting, self-balancing kind of system. So I think you'll enjoy, if you get into this further, uh, there are several different chapters just dealing with mental models and ways of thinking. A second area I wanted to show you was that uh, the leader, you know, illustrated here is somebody at a meeting in the upper right. Um, one of the things a visual leader can do is instruct people who are going to work visually on how to do it. And I, in, in the book, lay out nine different typical challenges in a meeting, and I'm not going to go over all of these, but one example might be is you have some new members on a team and you need to bring them up to speed, or maybe you need to establish some basic meeting, meeting discipline. Um, on the facing page in the book are then nine choices of what you can do. And 
I can't go through all of these, but it's basically a little questionnaire, and I'll go through a couple to show you what I mean. So I've got one question up here um, in the upper right. It says, you have some new members on your team that need to be brought up to speed. Now, if you glance over these different things, which one would really do that? Uh, an affinity chart with um, a bunch of sticky notes? Well, that might be one. Um, a parking lot to put ideas that aren't relevant to what you're talking about? Well, maybe, maybe not. A high-low grid to make decisions? You know, something that has high payoff, low payoff. This is number H down there. Not sure. Uh, the one I thought that that would go with is doing a graphic history, um, where one of the simplest ways to bring people up to speed is to tell the story of how you got to be where you are. And just putting up a piece of paper, putting up a simple timeline, maybe using sticky notes to show where people joined, and then having people tell the story and not worry so much about the graphics is one of the easiest ways to bring people up to speed. Let's just take another one. Um, you have a tight time frame for a meeting and you want to avoid uh, unrelated topics. Well, that would more than likely be just doing a parking lot, number D. You know, if you have a parking lot, anytime people bring up an unrelated topic, you just put it on the flip chart. That's a very simple visual meeting strategy. Let's take another one. You need to establish some basic meeting discipline on your leadership team. So you could use different of these, but the one I had in mind for that one uh, that's probably the best is this ORS chart. And what it suggests is that you want to at the start of any meeting, um, look at what the outcomes are, what the agenda is, what the roles, and what the rules are. And this little tool is one that often goes viral in a company once they see how to do it. It comes from the metaphor of um, a meeting being a little bit like a journey down a river in a boat and the agenda being the boat and the outcome being your destination down here of where you want to go and the roles and rules being the way you actually navigate on the river. So if you actually get clear about what your roles are and what the ground rules are in a meeting before you jump in, you're going to have a much better chance of making it down that river in a way that is productive and effective. So this little memory device is a way that you can kind of keep track of what's going on. So I won't go through the rest of these, but uh, you'll have fun. And I just came back from uh, a leadership development program with the United Health Group, and we handed this out. We handed out the nine challenges uh, that were here on, on this prior page, and then we handed out the, the nine things, and they, as tabletop groups, had to match them up. And it was really a great way to kind of raise everybody's visual literacy about what their choices are. Uh, these formats, of course, can be used in online web conferences uh, as well as in face-to-face -face meetings. They grew out of face-to-face -face meetings. But it's the kind of thing a visual leader would want to know and basically be able to say, hey, let's try this. Let's try doing a graphic history or let's try doing a graphic game plan. And I think that kind of visual guidance is what a contemporary leader or manager needs to be able to give if they want to have their workforce really work visually. So I'm going to conclude here with just a, a quick um, run through of the technology of visualization because another area where leaders ne really need to pay attention to are all the tools that allow you to do the visualizing. Now, these four tools here are the ones that are very, very common for doing business communications, uh, basically a phone and teleconference, emails, uh, increasingly texting, although that, that wouldn't be a bottom line business thing, but more and more uh, folks are texting, and video conferences. Now, what the book lays out are the pros and cons of each of these, as well as um, ask you which ones you're familiar with. But this isn't the problem. These four aren't really the problem. It's just they're not highly 
visual. Even the video conferences now. The, this, this is an example of a um, you know video conference where you actually look like you're seeing everybody on three different screens. Uh, the the use of graphics is still not completely figured out, but you generally do have one screen that will let you show the presentation or show what a whiteboard is. But increasingly, you have other technologies. Um, the visual meeting stuff that we're pioneering is is one whole set of technologies, including templates. Um, you have web conferences like this one, uh, which is very visual. Interactive whiteboards from groups like Smart Technology, web forums, online team rooms. Uh, more and more of these tools are available, and groups need guidance as to what to use. You also have slides, of course, which are ubiquitous. Murals and story maps uh, as an alternative to slides. Murals and story maps, of course, could be part of a visual meeting. Uh, they also could be part of a web conference. So these things can combine. Video and movies, I've already mentioned. Uh, plans and reports themselves are increasingly visual. And you have a new set of technologies around whiteboard animation. These are the kind of rapid animation things that groups like RSA Animate are doing, and the Grove is developing these as well uh, to explain different kinds of things. But if it if we're just those choices, it might be okay, but there's just another whole range of choices. And organizational blogs, chat networks, friend networks, internet social media, video sharing, that's all coming online in businesses and organizations, people figuring out how to use these actively, as well as this other media, particularly for learning, uh, e-learning, e-books, mobile apps, games and situations, virtual reality. The, the situation that modern managers are finding themselves in, I illustrated here, is just there are too darn many choices. And so what I'm advocating is that one of the visual leaders' challenges and jobs is to really kind of do a portfolio kind of exercise with these things. And I just included two examples to show you here. Um, let's just say you want to have uh, a web conference or something. Do you want to uh, have everybody have a standard way of doing it and use the, the organizational WebEx, which would be putting it down in here in this quadrant? Or do you want to just encourage people to do it with optional open source platforms like, you know, Skype or GoToMeeting or do whatever you want, but, you know, start doing it. How do you want to encourage your situation? Are you going to put in infrastructure or are you going to leave it up to people? Uh, the same thing would go for um, visual meetings. Are you going to actually train people in visual meetings and have people in a standard way? Everybody does the ORs uh, to start up a meeting, or is it, standard but open source. You let people kind of do what they want. You're not particularly advising any particular formats for the graphic templates or anything. You're just encouraging them to be visual. Or they're just up by themselves. So these kinds of uh, choices are very confusing if there isn't some direction from leadership, particularly if they require resources to pull off. Um, so visual leaders Leadership involves then mental models, it involves knowing what recommendations to make in visual meetings and, and how to shape and support technical environments. Um, this is my last slide here before we will open it up for questions. Um, I'm back to the landscape of all these strategies, but with a little metaphor of the butterfly. And one of the arguments that I'm making here is that visualization is is at a conceptual level a type of container or chrysalis that can hold a change process by actually allowing you to set up a temporary structure that can make people feel confident something is happening in an organized way. So you set up a whole series of meetings over a period of time that really aren't the regular way of doing business while the organization is going through its loop-to-loop. -loop. And this is the similar to the caterpillar getting in the chrysalis and melting down and then recombining. And all of these different um, steps in the flow, all these different steps I just 
bucketed the whole thing with white paint, which is the I'll do it this other way. If you do these um, different meetings and you set them up in a structured process, this can hold people uh, in a confident way while you go through your process and out you come with your desired results. So I think visualization is a transformational medium. It's one that can support uh, meetings, teams, and organization change. And this last book, Visual Leaders, is really showing leaders how they can be savvy about this and help their organizations take full advantage of all these new developments. So I'd like to open it up for questions at this point. And Melissa, if you've been seeing some chat come in, I'll be willing to answer any that uh, are appropriate here. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, everyone, at this time, if you could um, please enter in your questions. I'll get to them in just a moment. I see that some of you have already entered in um, your questions. We're going to transition back to um, some of my slides, and then we'll go ahead and I'll relay those to, uh, to David. Here again is David's contact information if you'd like to get in touch with him. Okay. Before we get are, they seeing, are they seeing your slide right now or mine? They are, yes. And I'll, when we get to the questions, David, I will transition um, back to you. Okay. Great. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank you so thank you. much. Um, so before we get to those, I just have a few reminders. Um, thank you, everyone, for staying with us um, as we go over just a little bit. A lot of great information there today. Um, for those who joined us later in the session, please feel free to visit our blog and join our Facebook and LinkedIn groups to stay updated on future events. And also, please follow our founder, Pierre Kwand, on Twitter. We're also going to be posting a recording of today's session in those Facebook and LinkedIn groups. And we're also going to post that on YouTube. So you'll have a convenient link there for you. Um, today we have, or today and continuing into about March 7th, when we announce the winners, there's three chances for you to win a copy of David's new book, which you learned a lot about today. You can tell there's some great information in there. Um, there's three chances there, and there's also a lot of other amazing prizes that we're giving away, such as a uh, free membership for a year to people on the go for our workshops um, and some of our books as, as well. Um, there is a link to the leadership survey. So that's how you'll be entered into the um, drawing to win the books and other prizes. And I'm going to share that again with you now. You can also um, access the survey through our blog on our website. We also are running um, some special offers. Uh, they're one-time specials for our new classes, and you can see that they're quite a deal, $19.95 for one seat, or if you want to get together with some of your coworkers, $49.95 for five seats. They're regularly $125 a piece. Uh, these, again, are our new workshops, Resolving Conflicts Productively, Creativity and Innovation. That would be a good follow-up to this one. Behavioral Interviewing, Project Management, Google Analytics. And you can find those on our website again, peopleonthego.com slash specials. And let me just show you our website here. You're probably familiar with it. And you can access more information about these uh, workshops here. And so now some of you have already um, entered in your questions and I'm gonna relay those to David and also transition uh, back to David as our presenter. Um, here's a good one to start out with. Uh, David, I'll, I'll transition you in just a moment. What if you need to accomplish several goals in one meeting? Do you use multiple strategies? Wouldn't that be maybe cumbersome and potentially confusing? Yes, um, the answer is yes. Uh, a meeting can have several different um, activities going on. Um, and in fact, a friend of mine, Lisa Kimball, from a group called Group Jazz, actually has an approach which she calls liberating structures. And she believes that one of the things that people get stuck in is doing things the same way all the time. And that that actually kind of freezes, it freezes up your thinking. And so she will, will show people several different um, ways that they can work with a meeting and let them pick ones. And then so they might do uh, 
World Cafe for you know a little bit of time, and then they might do a graphic template for another bit of time, and they you know might tell a group history for another. So uh, the key thing is to plan uh, what you're going to do in advance and think through how much time you're going to do. Uh, so I don't think it's confusing if you lay out clearly, you know, what you're, what you're intending. Do you have another question? Yes. Um, David, is there a boot camp for learning these techniques? Yes, go ahead. Oh, David, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, great. Um, the question was, is there a boot camp for learning these techniques? Okay, go ahead. Oh. What was the question? Oh, sure. Let me try one more time. Is there a boot camp for learning these techniques? Oh, yes, there is. Uh, the Grove itself teaches graphic facilitation um, and has regular workshops on it. You can get to that through www.grove.com. We also teach uh, strategic visioning, which is using templates. Uh, and these would be as close to a boot camp as you would get. Uh, if any organizations want to learn interior, uh, internally, we also customize client projects for them. Very nice. Um, David, are there graphic facilitation tools that you recommend? I'm sure there's quite a few, um, maybe the top three that you might recommend. Yeah, the, the most... Uh, useful one for face-to-face -face meetings, of course, is a flip chart, but big picture, uh, big poster paper can be retained from a plotter. Um, most of your inkjet printers, like HP has large plotters and Canon has large plotters, uh, have four foot by 50 yards even paper. And I would think providing people with big paper is one of the key things. Uh, if you're working online, uh, using a tablet is one of the best ways you can do it because almost all the conferencing programs allow screen sharing. And there's a very simple tab tablet called Bamboo, which is from a company called Wacom, and it only costs $99, and it fits into your USB port and allows you to use a pen with any program. Uh, you know, it's, it functions like a cursor, so if you're in a drawing program, you can draw with it. I'm using what's called a Cintiq tablet right now by uh, Wacom, and I'm actually seeing the digital ink come out right under my pen point. So, you know, what I'm drawing right now is showing up on this, and this functions like a second screen. It's actually hooked up to my computer, and so it's mirrored. The, the displays are mirrored, and I see what I'm doing, but I'm actually working on the Cintiq. And this is a little more complicated to do it, but if you're going to do a lot of facilitation online, uh, you can get much more control. So those would be two of my favorite ones. And then the other one, uh, I mean, the seven essential tools in the Visual Leader Book are really my answer to the question, but I would get involved with using graphic templates, particularly if you're a leader and don't draw yourself. And the graphic templates are pre-formatted group worksheets. I mean, an example would be a graphic game plan where you have an arrow going to a target over a set of challenges and having wheels of success factors. So you get people to answer, you know, what's my target? What do I have to work with? What are the tasks? What are the challenges? What are the success factors? And then they, they can, as a group, uh, develop an action plan in, in like 40 minutes and really get a good first sketch. So I would say those, those three, big paper, tablets, and graphic templates. Wonderful. Um, this is a, a question to maybe uh, to get to here um, about the book. David, how can I convince my CEO to read your book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. give, it, give it to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the thing that's really great about this latest book is it's in full color. Um, and you don't have to, to read this. Uh, in a reading kind of way. It's actually meant to be scanned. And um, that's part of the beauty of these new tools. Um, I actually 
wrote the book in InDesign with the tablet by my side. In fact, this was my authoring system. And I would write and draw, write and draw back and forth, and the book looked like it looked when it came out. So what I was able to do was to actually create uh, double pages in the book that are that literally show you what's happening. So I have a page in there on graphic histories, and it goes across two pages, and it shows you what a graphic history looks like. And so if you just flip through this book and look at the little sidebars, it's almost like reading USA Today in that regard. You can, in a very short period of time, see what's happening. Uh, then if you want to read it, you can read it. So I don't think you – you also might – argue with your CEO uh, a little bit about how visual the younger generation is right now. Um, a workforce is heading toward organizations right now that is completely fluid in all this stuff. Um, and those folks expect to be able to use images and graphics and text together in communicating. I mean, already PowerPoint is almost a standard for you know attaching emails. They have plans and things, but uh, increasingly videos um, are being attached and and being used. And I think a leader, you know, if they spent uh, a half an hour, an hour reading through this to see you know what the sweep is of what's going on, they'd be a lot further ahead. That's the hope. Very good. Thanks so much, David. Um, I think we'll get to one more question. We've already gone over a little bit and there's quite a few questions. David, if it's okay. all right, if people would like to follow up with you via email, is that um, yes. something That's you invite them perfect. to do? Yeah. Okay, great, because there's a lot of good questions, but we do have to wrap up in just a bit. So here's our final question. This is a good one. What do you suggest as an entry point for this visual approach for leaders who are totally new to this way of working? Um, the book itself lays out uh, seven, um, seven practices for increasing visual literacy. And one of them is visual note taking. And there's actually quite a bit of literature now at this level um, coming out uh, of how to do real simple icons. Like here is a simple person. You can learn how to draw that. You know, this is a simple flip chart, a lazy H. Uh, so visual note-taking is one. A second um, would be to actually uh, play with metaphors. So you look at your organization and you say, it's like a garden. Can I see all of my relationships? Say you're a consultant and you have a bunch of relationships. Which ones are the fruit trees that are bearing fruit? Which ones are the flowers? You know, which ones, which are my relationships to the grass? And you actually do forced metaphor play. Another one would be to just diagram some process that you are trying to understand and use very simple, you know, circles and arrows and see if over time you can characterize some key process. These are all things that you can do in your own note taking um, that raise your, your visualization thing. So I think people who want to get more visual. Uh, in terms of using visuals, would do this kind of practice activity. If you want to just get more exercise thinking visually, um, you know, then studying uh, metaphors and models. There's, there's several chapters in the book on mental models, and almost all organizations have frameworks for thinking about how everything connects together, and beginning to have a vocabulary of mental models that you're familiar with um, in your mind, like are you involved with the STAR model for thinking about your organizational system, or I, I, I share Tushman's um, four box kind of model, uh, and John, Charles O'Reilly at Stanford has his four box model, or there's the 7S model. Uh, these are all different mental models, the S curve, uh, these are things that you would learn in business school to think about organizations. And so this is all example of visual thinking. It's actually visual thinking is the way that we understand systems, is we basically make displays uh, on some kind of paper or software or in our brain um, 
and that's that's what we mean by systems thinking. So I think it's a pretty critical skill as we move forward into the 21st century. Agreed. Thank you so much, David, for sharing so many tips and so much valuable information with us today. Everyone, thank you so much for your questions. And again, please feel free to contact David um, if you'd like to follow up with him. Um, when you exit the webinar today, a feedback form will pop up and we uh, invite you to please uh, fill that in. That's very helpful for us. David, thank you again for joining us. I'm going to log out in just a moment and I hope to see you next month um, at, our, at our upcoming Lunch and Learn. Thank you everyone and have a great day.